like to welcome everyone here today to our first conference in this fabulous surroundings of the Guinness Storehouse. We're very proud this year, the year of the gathering, to have this opportunity to bring our members and stakeholders here together under the Federation umbrella for the very first time. We're delighted, therefore, to have such strong representation from our key stakeholders. We have Tom O'Mahony and Donna Morgan here today from the Department of Transport, Tourism and Sport, John Tracy from the Irish Sports Council, Sean Benton and Barry O'Brien from the National Sports Campus Development Authority, and of course a very strong turnout from our own members. In fact, we have over 40 sporting organisations here today, which is fantastic. We're also thrilled to have Sir Keith Mills, um, who's kindly agreed to travel to Dublin to speak to us today. To have someone with such a distinguished track record in both business and sport has contributed greatly to the anticipation of today's event. On behalf of our board and our CEO, I would like to thank all our speakers who have agreed to participate, our event partners Diageo in providing the fabulous venue, our other partners in Coca-Cola, Shared Access, IPB and BHP, all of, who, all of whom have made today a possibility. Thanks also to our exhibitors, Exilion, Crown Plaza, Blanchardstown, CI Structures, Future Fit, Print Depot, OSK, 2 into 3, Max Sport and My Club Finances. The Federation is, of course, about bringing sport together. We wanted, with today's event, to create an atmosphere of togetherness, a sense of positivity about just what sport can achieve, and most of all, an opportunity to forge relationships and develop new relationships. So in conclusion, I hope you all enjoy the day. And on that note, I want to thank our MC for the day, Jackie Hurley, who I will now hand over to to get proceedings underway. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Sarah. The most important thing she warned me about is the steps over here. Um, always good to know when you're in a new surrounding that if you're a woman and you're wearing heels, be careful. Um, welcome to everybody for coming. I think you'll all agree it's a beautiful venue. And importantly, in Ireland, the sun is shining, which means I can tell by the smiles on all your faces that you've been enjoying it for the day. So that certainly is good news. Um, welcome along to what has been something that's been in the pipeline for an awful long time and I think so many of you in this room have contributed to the reason why we're here today I'd like to thank the Federation for asking me to be part of this because it's something that I genuinely really believe in I think the reason we're all here today is because we have a common goal and that is our love of sport and we want to see it being driven forward as an organization as a multitude of organizations who are represented to here today and just in terms of a country and what we can do in terms of driving that success it's great to see so many of you here and we will be asking for for lots of floor contributions. We'll have a panel discussion a little bit later on and we'd love to get your input on that as well. So please do feel free to stick up the hand and ask a question at any point of the day. It is an informal sort of an afternoon and we really, really would enjoy your input right throughout that. Now just to give you an idea of some of the events that will be happening today, um, as we mentioned, Sir Keith Mills has given up his time and we are really, really interested to hear what he'll have to say a little bit later on. You can hear from him in, in just a few moments. Before that, uh, or after that I should say, we'll have an idea of sort of where the Federation began, the, the rooting of it all, where I suppose the, 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 their place in Irish sport and what exactly they've been doing. Alistair Gray and the CEO Sarah O'Connor will give us an idea of the Federation's roots and where we're going and all of that will culminate with the preparation and the presentation of the strategic plan, which you'll have a little bit later on. We'll then have our panel discussion, which as I mentioned, all of our speakers will be part of that. We're also very privileged to have the Irish boxing team captain, Darren O'Neill, is with us today. Not only in his role as an ambassador in Irish sport and one of the, the boxers who was lucky enough to go to the Olympics last year, but also he is a primary school teacher and has a lot of views on where we should be going with children in Ireland and exactly how we can implement sport at a younger underage level and see where we can develop that. We'll, after our uh, panel discussion, we'll have dinner at about 7 o'clock and drinks reception and all that after that as well. So uh, plenty more to come throughout the day, but to bring it forward, and we mentioned we have a really, really good uh, keynote speaker today. He doesn't really need too much of an introduction, but I'll give him one anyway. He gave us air miles. How many of us in this room have 
enjoyed the benefits of that particular scheme over the last few years. More recently, though, he's become known as the man who gave us the Home Olympics and Paralympics, and another brilliant thing that Irish people have had a joy to be part of. A really, really long road, one that began back in 2003 when he was appointed the international president and CEO of London 2012, the company that was set up to go and bid for the Olympic Games. He and Lord Seb Coe had the joyful task of going and trying to convince 115 OCI members that London was in fact the right city to host the game. From that point then he went on to become the uh, deputy chairperson of the London Organisation Committee for the London Games and the Paralympic Games and I think you'll all agree having either been there or watched it on TV it was probably one of the best sporting events we've witnessed in recent modern history. So I'd like to congratulate you, Sir Keith Mills, on that alone. I'm really looking forward to what you have to say. Please welcome, ladies and gentlemen, our guest speaker today, Sir Keith Mills. I'm not going to risk the step. I haven't got high heels on, but uh, it looked pretty wobbly to me. Um, well, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for the invitation to come and uh, speak today. And um, uh, I'm going I'm to be talking generally about uh, working together in sport, because certainly for the last 10 years, uh, preparing for the Games, uh, it couldn't have been achieved either winning it or hosting it without, uh, without an enormous amount of, of uh, cooperation right across the country. Um, so the theme of my, my chat today is about uh, working together in sport, but, but, but before I, I sort of start uh, on that subject, uh, we had a discussion uh, earlier today, uh, and uh, a much more fundamental discussion, and uh, the reason it's, it, it's important in the context of your conference here today um, is because we are living in tough economic times. Uh, public spending is being reduced, and I know spending on sport here has been reduced over the uh, recent years and, and indeed um, whilst I'm sure you had in Ireland uh, a bit of a commercial boost le leading up to the games commercially as we did in London um, that can quickly uh, ebb away uh, and, uh, uh, and I guess the thing that we should all be asking ourselves which is I know a really stupid question but one that that uh, I, I remember my little grandson uh, asked me all the time, and that is, what's it for? You know, what is sport for? And it was brought home to me really clearly um, about uh, eight months before the London Games when I went to speak to um, pretty much all of the performance directors of all of the sports that would be competing in London. And uh, the purpose of, of the meeting was for me to explain to them what they would expect as we led up to the Games, uh, and for them to brief me on how they thought we were going to do in terms of performance uh, in the games. And they gave me a, a very, uh, actually, uh, detailed and uh, an exciting briefing about how well they thought we would do. And to their great credit, uh, they exceeded their expectations in terms of performance. But at the end of the, the, the meeting, um, when they explained to me how many medals we were going to win, I sort of posed a question to them, which was, we've spent over 600 million pounds of taxpayers money over the last four years on 1200 athletes uh, and we're going to get a lot of medals hopefully in london but what for what is the benefit i mean we all feel good we all cheered uh, those of us that were lucky enough to be there or those of us watching television but actually fundamentally what was that contributing to society and I think the challenge we have in sport all of us that are involved in sport whether in in Ireland or, or in the UK is making that case because if we can't make the case for why sport is important then we will struggle we'll struggle with public funding we'll struggle with commercial funding we'll, we'll struggle to maintain uh, the momentum in our in our sports and uh, and so you know, the subtext of, of perhaps what I'm going to be talking about today is all about trying to quantify... I'm a businessman, uh, and, and until 10 years ago, uh, did nothing in sport other than watch it and, uh, and enjoy it, uh, but certainly was not part of, of, of managing it. But as I've got more and more involved in sport, um, it becomes increasingly apparent to me that unless we can make, as a sector, 
a much, much coherent argument uh, than we have been historically uh, will continue to be the poor relation. And in particular, we will be right at the bottom of the political agenda. Uh, we struggle in the UK, even with the Olympic Games, to climb up the political agenda because governments have huge numbers of priorities and sport, sadly, sits generally at the bottom. Uh, but if we are, uh, as a sector, going to uh, be successful in the future, we need to move ourselves up the agenda. So that was sort of by, by way of context for what I'm, I'm going to be talking about uh, today. Uh, my involvement in sport, as you've heard, um, uh, certainly in Olympic terms, started 10 years ago um, uh, with, the, with the bid. Um, prior to that, actually, um, I have had my own personal sport is sailing. I've had a couple of sports teams, sailing teams that I've uh, been looking after. For my sins, I'm a director of Tottenham Hotspur Football Club, uh, who should absolutely be in the Champions League uh, this year. But that lousy club in North London called Arsenal uh, won their match at, at the weekend, uh, so sadly no Champions League for us. Uh, I have a uh, sports foundation called Sported, which I'm going to be talking about later on uh, today. Um, and, uh, and many of the things that I now do, even in my business life, are involved in and around uh, sport. And I passionately believe um, that sport does deliver very significant social and economic benefits to any country. The challenge is always proving it. Um, and, and I've seen it work in practice, uh, in education, in health, uh, in social inclusion, um, but there seems not to have been, historically anyway, sufficient evidence to prove to funders, whether it's public funders or, or private funders, commercial funders, uh, that uh, prevention is better than cure. And we all know the very positive benefits that sport can bring to society, but unless we make that case that investing in sport, which will have huge positive economic and social consequences as a result, uh, we'll all be uh, struggling. Um, one of the things that over the last 10 years has been very clear to me uh, and probably clear to everyone in this room that uh, touches government and I'm sure it's the same in Ireland, it, it is in most of the countries that I've been to, and that is that uh, government itself is not very well connected. Uh, government by and large works in silos and sadly sport does too by and large and one of the great things uh, I think about the Federation here is a real real attempt to try and bring sport together which I think is a is a fabulous initiative and one that I, I really uh, support. Um, the problem with a fragmented uh, anything, uh, whether it be government or sport, uh, is that you have much less effective outcomes. Um, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the most successful, um, well, let's take sport as an example, some of the most successful organisations in sport, I was talking earlier about the Premier League, uh, in, uh, in the UK. Premier League over the next three years will generate £5.2 billion of commercial broadcasting revenues. £5.2 billion. Now, amongst the Premier League is probably the most successful sports brand in the world, Manchester United. Uh, now, you would have thought that Manchester United, given the value, would say, no, 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 we'll do, we'll have our own marketing programs, we'll sell our own rights because we'll get more money that way. But Man United are not stupid, uh, and they know that they're at, they will actually be much better in a Premier League environment where you've got QPR at one end of the spectrum and, and the mighty Man United at the other. And by working together, those Premier League teams through the Premier League organisation itself have generated substantially more support commercially than they would have done on their own. And I think that's the sort of theme that I'd like to... Uh, to, to work on today. And I'm going to touch on three areas specifically, the games and my experience of how we worked together to deliver uh, a very special event last summer. Um, the sport for development sector, which is very close to my heart, that's where sport and sports clubs uh, use sport as a means to an end, a means to a social end. And I have a, a foundation called Sported that's been up and running for five years, uh, which I'd like to tell you about. Uh, and then finally, um, the commercial sector and sport, where I've been doing some work too. But let's start with the, with, with the games themselves. Uh, when I was asked to um, uh, 
uh, run the bid uh, back in 2003, uh, we were given a pretty awful chance. We were late into the bidding process. Uh, we had bid three times before and failed miserably. Um, our reputation around the world for hosting sporting events was an all-time low. We'd actually won uh, the World Athletics Championships and then decided that we couldn't afford a stadium and we gave it back. You know, so we were not in a good place. Uh, but I really th thought that we had a great chance if we could all work together. And uh, uh, if I can explain the sort of bidding process briefly, uh, we had nine countries bidding for the London uh, for the 2012 games, um, and the most. Imp uh, if one looked at bidding processes before, those cities and those countries that bid successfully b before did so because they presented a united package uh, to the IOC members that uh, ultimately made the decision. And uh, it was pretty clear that, looking at our previous uh, British bids, um, that they hadn't actually had all of the support of all of the countries. So the, the most important thing was to get all of the stakeholders in the UK behind the bid, from the government uh, to the general public and everyone in between, the federations, um, uh, all of the sports clubs across the UK, all had to be behind the bid. Even, uh, dare I say it, the, culture se the cultural sector had to be behind the bid. And we all know that sometimes sport and culture uh, have an interesting uh, relationship. We had to really understand how the decision making in the IOC was going to take place, uh, and we had to um, uh, we had to present to them uh, a vision for our games, and we had to present to them uh, and prove to them that we had the capability of delivering them practically successfully. And one of our biggest challenges uh, was proving that we could build an Olympic Park in the East End of London. Uh, Paris uh, were very successful um, in explaining to the IOC that they had many, many more existing venues in Paris than, than we had in London. And indeed, they boasted that they had 15 50-metre swimming pools, and London, sadly, had none. Uh, we did actually have one, uh, Crystal Palace, until somebody decided to put a new skin on it and it was six inches too short. Um, so we had a big challenge to persuade the IOC that actually we had uh, the venue capabilities. And I, I know that there's been some discussion about uh, uh, Ireland's bid for perhaps a Rugby World Cup, and one of the keys there will be all about venues. Um, but the most important part of our venue package was redeveloping really the whole of East London, um, and that required a massive amount of cooperation. If I can tell you, it took 10 years to get planning permission for Terminal 5 at Heathrow. Uh, we had less than a year to get planning permission for the largest development in UK history. The only way we were able to make that happen was by working together, which again is a, a theme for, for today. We had, to, um, we had to raise a huge amount of money. Um, and most importantly, we had to get public opinion behind us. Um, when we started the bid, 48% of the British public did not think it was a good idea we bid, um, and we had to improve that. Um, the result was, as you all know, we won. We beat um, our friends in Paris, 54 votes to 50. Uh, but primarily, if you talk to IOC members, they will tell you uh, that the reason we, bid, that we won was that we presented a united front. And interestingly, in Paris, the, uh, uh, the French National Olympic Committee uh, and the French sports ministry were, were at war uh, with each other, and that showed through, uh, and it was certainly one of the, the reasons they didn't uh, make it. In terms of the games themselves, um, it's the largest of event, it's the largest thing that any country can organise uh, in peacetime. It is a massively complex uh, event, and it requires huge uh, cooperation across every element of society, from government right the way uh, through to local uh, communities. Um, and government, historically, is not good at working together. And we, I used to convene meetings of numerous government departments to try and coordinate them. And this was almost a, uh, this was unique in their, uh, you know, uh, their history. They, they, they work in silos. Um, 
we had to get the federations to work together. And uh, federations are very protective of their own sports. Uh, but what was critically important to us was that we got them all to buy into uh, one vision. Uh, we had to recruit a large number of volunteers. When we went out and asked for volunteers for the Games, we had 250,000 uh, applications. We interviewed, 120, 000, interviewed for two hours each person 120,000. 120,000 interviews to get 70,000 volunteers. Um, we had a massive venue construction uh, project to undertake. Um, if I can tell you that uh, um, within, I think, three weeks of winning the bid, we started construction on uh, building six kilometers of tunnels, rather like a tube tunnel, so that we could take all the power lines down and put the power under the uh, the Olympic Park, uh, which would normally have taken three or four years. We didn't have three or four years, we had 18 months. So it's a massive amount of cooperation. Every part of society in, in, uh, in the country got involved in delivering uh, the, the Games. Uh, security issues, you can imagine, a massive, massive undertaking, uh, along with very, everyone that's been to London will know the security, the transport challenges we have in, in London. Uh, all of that uh, could only be done by working together. We made a, a, a lot of promises leading up to the Games, uh, but last summer the, the country literally came together. Uh, and uh, we, I think, uh, uh, surprised ourselves that it, it actually all went so well. Um, and one of the challenges we have now is to make sure some of the promises we made during the bid uh, uh, continue as a legacy after the, the games. And we built around our games, you might remember. In fact, we started this in the bidding phase and we carried it right the way through the preparation phase. And during the games themselves, it was our primary uh, message, which is that the London Games was designed to inspire a generation. Uh, we said in Singapore that if you give us the Olympic Games in 2012, we'll use them to inspire the youth of the world. Uh, and one of the key legacies that will be left um, uh, post-games is making sure that we continue uh, that theme. We had a, a very, very large educational program called Get Set in 25,000 schools across the UK. That's continuing uh, post-games. Uh, we had a, a two fantastic sport for development projects. Uh, I say fantastic because I chair both of them, uh, uh, that have been fantastically successful. One is called International inspiration, uh, which has sports programs up and running in 20 countries around the world uh, and has had 14 million children around the world go through these uh, programs. And the second is a domestic program called Sported I mentioned uh, uh, earlier. I'd like now to focus a little on Sported because there are some very interesting parallels for the whole of sport in what we've done. So the concept here was that Across the UK, there were, it appeared, a very large number of clubs, we think somewhere around 10,000, that use sport as a means to an end, not for, sport for, uh, not for sport for sport's sake, but sport for development. Using sport to help disadvantaged kids, uh, whether they have trouble with at school or whether they have trouble uh, with the police or drugs or antisocial behaviour. And, and there'll be lots of clubs like that, I'm sure, uh, here in uh, Ireland, they do fantastic work, but they were completely uncoordinated. There was no umbrella, nobody was speaking on their behalf, uh, and they were frankly struggling, uh, as uh, most uh, um, Western economies are now. Public spending has been reduced in the UK, and these clubs uh, were struggling to, to, to survive. Um, one of the things that uh, we found uh, when we started talking to these clubs was that their needs were really quite basic. And so we established this foundation called Sported to provide them with three uh, key elements of, of need. One was uh, information and backup. They were pretty much left on their own. And some of these clubs were tiny. A couple of fathers start a judo club, start a football club uh, on their estate to get the kids away from doing uh, bad things. Uh, some of them were much more established clubs, but they were all struggling. They needed help um, uh, in the way that they ran their, their clubs. They needed sometimes a third party, and we now have several hundred mentors, mostly business mentors, that go into these clubs and help these clubs 
become more sustainable. Uh, and then thirdly, they need, as all of them do, funding. Uh, and Sported is able to work with other funders. Uh, we put our own money into projects uh, and we try and get these clubs to, to adopt business plans that ensure they, could, uh, they can uh, survive for many years to come uh, on their own. But they could only do that if they worked under an umbrella organisation called Sported. And one of the things that um, we did to support them was to open 12 regional offices around the UK. Um, and through those regional offices, uh, and I think our office up in uh, uh, Belfast, uh, which was one of the later ones to start, now has, I think, 150, 160 clubs uh, in Northern Ireland um, with a wide range of sports um, and uh, has really started to make an impact in, in the north. The, the, what, they, what these clubs really needed more than anything else um, was uh, an infrastructure. And by working together, uh, all of these clubs, we now have almost 2,500 sported member clubs in the UK, they're starting to be able to make a difference. And what that enables us to do for them um, is raise the profile of the fantastic work that they do um, and raise the financial resources to support them. But most importantly, and this is something that we launched yesterday in London, uh, start to be able to demonstrate the financial and, and social impacts that they have. We designed a, uh, a, a new tool called SportWorks, uh, and it's something that we talked uh, earlier today about whether this might be applicable here in, in Ireland. And SportWorks is a uh, computer-based, uh, software-based tool that clubs can use to populate themselves that provides both the club and sported with the data, the hard data, that proves and demonstrates the impact that that club is happening, having on that particular community. Uh, and nationally, it means that we're able to go to government and commercial funders and, uh, and, and for that matter, donors, and, and be able to make the business case to prove the commercial uh, and the social and the financial impact that any club has uh, on their local uh, community. Um, and by doing that, we're starting to be able to engage with government departments, with the likes of Comic Relief, uh, to, to be able to not only show them what has happened historically, but be able to show to them that if they were to invest their money in this particular uh, intervention, they would get, uh, they'd get a, a good return. So if, if uh, Sport Works is something that uh, could be adopted here in, in Ireland. We'd be very happy to uh, help you look at it because it's one way of really uh, demonstrating to, uh, to government in particular uh, that sport actually does provide a great return. Um, the other area that, that, that we've been looking at um, really quite hard for almost a year now, I suppose, is in the months leading up to the Games and, and, and subsequently, was the concern around commercial support for sport. Um, historically, uh, Olympic host cities uh, create huge interest. And I heard earlier that uh, in, in Ireland, the uh, number of commercial organizations that were prompted by the games to get involved and get behind sport uh, increased. And that was certainly the case in the UK where uh, we raised uh, uh, about, about a billion pounds um, from about 50 or 60 companies um, to help us fund the Games. Uh, but historically, if you look back at previous uh, Olympic Games and other big sports events, uh, that support drops really fast, off a cliff, uh, once the Games are, are, are gone. Uh, and I was very anxious to make sure that um, for the London Games, sport could try and maintain some of that momentum commercially. It seems like common sense, but in sport, not a lot is common sense. Um, but each sports organization in the UK, and I'm sure here in Ireland, pretty much uh, organizes their own commercial affairs. They go off and try and get their own sponsors uh, and raise their own uh, money. And that's certainly how it works in the, in the UK. A very large percentage of most sports revenues come from the public sector. 
uh, as high as 95% with summer sports. Uh, and given the public spending environment which we're in, that makes those sports incredibly vulnerable. So not only uh, did we have an opportunity to try and maintain the momentum of the games commercially by hanging on to some commercial value, uh, but we have an obligation because the expectation is after 2016, public funding will start dropping in the UK pretty uh, dramatically. The problem was that sport, as I said, historically has all worked in individual silos. They've all done their own thing. They've all had their own commercial strategies. Uh, but I, for the last six months, have been working on a concept called the British Sports Marketing Bureau, which some of you may have, uh, have heard of. And this was a concept, an idea, nothing more than that, to try and bring sport together commercially. Not to suggest that sports don't go out and try and sell their own sport, uh, that would be stupid, but our experience during the games was that's not how companies buy into sport. You know, Procter & Gamble are really not interested in gymnastics or swimming or tennis individually. They're not interested at all. They're interested in selling soap powder. That's their business. And when you talk to Procter & Gamble, they'll tell you that they're interested in reaching mums. And if sport can reach mums, that's something they're interested in. But if you walk through the door trying to sell your netball or your gymnastics or your swimming, they'll turn you away. So the British Sports Marketing Bureau concept was to persuade all of sport in the United Kingdom to endorse a, a, a new agency, a, a not-for-profit commercial organization that would interface between the commercial sector and sport and present sport in a very different way. So the Bureau would go and talk to companies not about any individual sport. It would talk to companies about what those companies were looking for in terms of marketing and business plans to deliver their, on their objectives. And then it would go away and bolt together the different sports rights from different sports organisations that match those objectives. Uh, and for the last several months, we've been consulting with sports organisations in the UK to see whether they would uh, endorse that concept. And I have to tell you, it's been a struggle. It's been difficult. Um, it's been difficult because of the silos in which sport operates. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, you know, the, the jury is still out on whether this bureau will get off the ground. But I'm absolutely convinced um, that if we can get a, a bureau like this off the ground, it may not be it'll happen soon, perhaps it'll, it'll take some more time, uh, but it, uh, sport will, will get a much larger share of the cake. The cake will actually get bigger if they work together, just like the Premier League. You know, the Premier League have raised vast amounts of revenues because they've worked together. And if sport can work together, um, then it too can get a larger share of, of the commercial uh, cake. Uh, uh, but I, I mean, I have to say it's been a struggle. We've probably, probably got um, two-thirds, I guess, of sports organisations prepared to endorse this concept. Uh, but it's some of the larger sports, and I know we've got some of the larger sports here today, uh, that sort of take the view uh, we're better to, 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 to do it on our own. And, uh, and I have to say that that's not, that's not my experience. And to the extent that this is something that you'd find interesting to pursue over here in Ireland, I'd be very happy to give you uh, the benefit of my advice on how you go about doing it. So in sort of conclusion, uh, the message I give you uh, here, uh, knowing that um, public funding here has been challenging in recent years and is probably going to continue to be challenging, is that sport needs to work together to raise sport up the agenda, the political agenda, and sport needs to work together to prove its value to society. And only when it uh, proves its value to society, not in anecdotal ways, we've all got wonderful anecdotal stories about how sport is wonderful, but the people with the purse strings, whether they're corporate purse strings or, uh, uh, or public purse strings, um, uh, want evidence. Um, and uh, we know, we all know the impact sport can have. Um, and just before I finish, I'm just going to show you a short 
film, uh, which um, uh, and this film is made up of real kids from the clubs that sported my foundation um, uh, support. So this is their their stories cut together in a short film. Where I came into the world, everyone was looking for a way out. Life was competition between right and wrong, and right was in a record losing streak. After turning my back on school, I thought my chance to learn had passed. Sometimes, though, it takes a ball to teach you lessons a school couldn't. Or a pair of gloves to get beneath your skin. And to help you realise who your real opponent is in life. I discovered that my way out might be staying put. Facing my fears, not running from them. You can always turn things around this early in the first half. So I banished my anger. And at the same time, learn to let fly. I gain strength from losing and confidence from winning. You may not get to choose where you start in life, but you can sure have a say where you finish. Now, to get that message through, we made that film to, uh, to, to show to uh, our funders. To get that message through requires an enormous coordinated um, uh, effort. And one of the things I've been trying to encourage the UK government uh, to get behind um, is the development of a national strategy for sport, uh, a national sport strategy. Uh, I don't think one exists here in, in Ireland, and it certainly doesn't exist in the UK. So in the UK, our Department of Education organise schools and school sport in one silo, and the Department of Health organise their sport interventions in another silo and the local communities and, and regions organise sport and run the playing fields and the swimming pools in another silo and the NGBs do their thing in another silo and so it goes on. Uh, and until a country um, develops a national sport strategy that has some joined up thinking, sport will struggle to get up the political agenda. So my message to you today is uh, this is a great initiative, um, this conference and, and this organization, get behind it, work together, and by working together you really can uh, make an impact both in terms of sustainability of sport, the growth of sport, and the impact on, uh, on your wonderful country. It's great to be here in Dublin. Thank you.